Spanish acts today. Okay, other groups booed. Boo. All right. All right. We have been in Acts for about a year and five months, and we have covered every verse, uh, every chapter. We have walked through it, and today we finish up the book of Acts. These are some of the words you're going to see in today's message. And my goal today is to not only finish the book, but give us a wrap-up of why God has had us be on this journey for over a year. And I will say to you that it has been inspiring to me to even think back when I was putting this together, just all the different elements that we've looked at, the, the connections that have been made. And so we'll do that as a part of the end, but just um, thank you for taking the journey uh, with us in this book. Um, It truly has been great, and uh, I can't wait to share with you this list, this last little part. So here we go. This is Acts chapter 28, starting in verse 11. Last week, we ended up that that the uh, ship that Paul and the other men were on actually crashed on the island of Malta. On that, uh, Paul uh, got a ministry to the people on that island, specifically through the chief of that island, and has been for three months ministering to those people. And as you pick up in verse verse 11, it says, after three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. So what you have here is is that uh, everyone when it came to about September or October, who had a ship, found a, uh, found a cove, uh, found a bay to be in to basically winter for the, the months from the basically October through, through March because you just literally were not on the ocean during that time. And so although they have been on this island, they found that there was a ship who's an Alexandrian ship, which means it's a Greek ship, that actually found a cove and has been there for the winter, and that is the ship that's going to take them from this island. This Alexandrian ship, which means it's a Greek ship, remember there are three powerful people groups. You have the Romans, the Greeks, and the Jews. So you have uh, Paul heading to Rome on a Greek ship as a Jew. Just put that together. That's kind of fun. But the idea of it is is that these two, it says there were twin gods. Those gods would have been Castor and Pollux. They were supposedly the sons of Zeus and Leda, And these twins were supposed to be saviors. They were good fortune on the seas, and so that's why they would have been on the ship. But what you have is that you have uh, a people group that they lost everything when they crashed on this island, and the people of the island have given them everything they've needed and paid passage for Paul, specifically Paul and the soldiers, to go on to the next part. Because, again, now Paul Paul is going to be heading to Rome. So let's go forward. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. So they go from Malta to Syracuse. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at at Rigium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to, and I cannot say this word, and so so what happens is, is that they're basically moving up. I'll show you a map in just a second. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. So... This is what happens. Malta's down here in the bottom corner. They end up Malta. They go to Syracuse, and then they're going to get head on up, and then you'll see. And then when they get to this place, this is where they go inland. They don't take a boat anymore. They're actually walking on land as they go to Rome. And verse 15 becomes very important, and we're going to take a little side note. And the brothers there, and the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Apias and three, tra- and three taverns to meet us, On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Now, the reason why that is important is I need to give you the backstory. Paul wrote a letter to the Roman people about two and a half years previous. The book of Romans is the only book in which Paul writes where he has not been to the place in which he is writing. He had been to Ephesus, wrote back to Ephesus, been to Philippi, wrote back to Philippi. He wrote to Rome and basically wrote them a letter because it was very important that he write to them because of a situation going on and says, my desire is to be with you. And he thought he was going to come through their area in the next five to six months. It's two and a half, almost three years later. But what happened is, is that Rome, not only being the center of the known world, I mean, it's the Roman Empire, it's the, it is the headquarters of everything going on, Paul wrote to the Roman people because of a situation that had taken place. The situation was this. The Caesar at the time had kicked all the Jews out of Rome. He was done with them and kicked them all out. As a matter of fact, that's how he met Priscilla and Aquila. They had been kicked out of Rome. And in that process, the Christians had kind of taken that place. 
So as these people were kicked out, the Christians had become significant in that city. The Jews are let back in, and so are the Jewish Christians. And there was all this conflict of the Christians, Jews, Jewish Christians in Rome. One of the underlying themes of the whole book of Romans is Paul talking about what happens as Christ brings unity between these groups and speaks to them. And if you read it with the understanding, when Paul wrote this, he was trying to encourage them because there was such conflict to say Christ unifies us. But how difficult that was because you have people, obviously, who were very proud of their heritage, very proud of their bloodline, and very jealous of the fact that the Gentiles were just getting adopted in. And when you read the book of Romans, that's the context. So here's what's interesting. The book of Romans in the New Testament is one of the most weighty, theologically doctrine books in the New Testament. And if you read it, he goes after people pretty strongly. So as he comes to Rome, he does not know how this letter has been received or whether or not they even want him because he was so, uh, so just on it and telling people what it was. So when it says, and the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the form of Apias and the three taverns to meet us, and it says that he was, took courage is because they are receiving him. They are excited to have Paul, this one who wrote this letter to encourage them and has done so much for this area. It's a significant book of the book of Romans. It's a significant thing that they are receiving him because he did not hold anything back in that book and they're receiving him. And so that is with great courage that he is coming, uh, with great encouragement he is coming to them. Verse 16. And, then, and, when we, and when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who guarded him. Okay. Now, if you were a, 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 a serious situation, you would always have two soldiers with you at all time. They consider Paul lightweight, okay? So he only gets one soldier, all right? And basically, he's under house arrest, which means he kind of just hangs out in his condo and he has a soldier with him, all right? There's a tradition, it's not in Scripture, there's a tradition that Paul kept converting his guards into Christianity, which means they kept having to give him new guards, which means he just kept converting them into Christianity. So his whole thing was they kept giving him people and he just kept converting them. Now that's a tradition, but I'd love to have that be the case that that happens, that basically, hey, you, and I remember when I was in youth ministry, <laughs> there was a kid that I keep telling the story where he made a commitment that anybody that sat next to him uh, sat next to him in school, he was going to win him to Christ. So a kid would sit next to him, he'd win him to Christ, they'd be talking, he'd be fine because he won him to Christ, so they'd give him a new person. He was great because they just give him a new person to witness to. He was excited about that. But how do you take an attitude that says, look, I'm going to make this, and so make this my, my ministry? And we're going to talk about his ministry in his home in just a minute. So here we go. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them. So here's what you need to understand. Paul is in Rome three days, and he calls the leaders of the Jews together. He's done this in every city that it was possible. He goes to the Jews first. He goes to the Jews first because in doing so, he understands that they get his God. The God of the Christians and the God of the Jews is the same God. We recognize Jesus as God. They do not. But when he goes to them and speaks with them, when he speaks, they know what he's talking about. And so he would go and speak to the Jews. But he also understands that Jesus has given him the ministry of being the apostle to the Gentiles. And he is definitely going to talk about that at the end of this passage but he first goes to the Jews and says to them, I want to speak with you. Watch what happens. Brothers, notice that. He calls them brothers. Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the custom, customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. This is what he's saying. I am still one of you. Now, this becomes very important that we grasp this because it is very easy. I mean, it, it blows my mind how many Christians think that somehow we're against the Jews. And the reality is that's not true. Folks, we stand on the shoulders of the Jews. Those from Moses, those from David, those from the prophets, those 
that we, we stand because all we are, we believe, is the next chapter of the Messiah coming and then us living out what it means to be the children of God. But the Jews believe it does, that their Messiah is yet to come. He has not yet come. And there is our difference. And Paul goes, look, I am one of you. I believe in the law. I believe in what has happened. I believe in these things. And he makes sure he connects with them. Brothers, our people, our fathers. Yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had, being the Romans, examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. Not Felix, not, not Festus, and not Agrippa wanted to keep him. There was no reason to keep him. There was nothing by Roman law that means that he should pay the death penalty for what he had done. Nothing. But what he says, but because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. He goes, I have no problem to bring against, I have no issue that I am bringing the Jews against anything, but if but the, the Jews in Jerusalem were not letting up, and my only option out, my only way out was to appeal to Caesar. That's what he tells this group in Rome. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. Look what he says. Because of the hope of Israel. And Paul's going to make this very clear. The only difference between you Jews in Rome and me is I believe that the hope of Israel came in the person of Jesus Christ. Now you need to understand something. When you read the Old Testament, it's like a funnel. All of it is pointing to this point which the Messiah would come and change everything. All of it's pointing that way. From the first book, I mean, literally from the book of Genesis, where it talks about the fact that there would be a one who would crush the head of the serpent. I mean, all of it is pointing to that there would be a Messiah, a chosen one, a holy one, that would come and change everything. And the difference between these Jews and Paul is that Paul sees that really, truly, Jesus is that answer. That he is the fulfillment. And we're going to talk about that more as we go along. Verse 21. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. Let me explain to you why. It's very important that you grasp this. Two and a half years later, they have not heard of what happened in Jerusalem. Let me tell you why. Because what they did in Jerusalem was wrong. It was wrong. A matter of fact, it was their dirty laundry. Because... Remember, he is grabbed out of the temple for no reason, beaten in the streets. The high priest has him struck in the face. All of this is wrong. And all they're trying to do is keep Paul in front of Festus, in front of Felix. And listen, the Jews knew there was no way that Festus or Felix or Agrippa were going to give Paul the death penalty. And if you remember, that wasn't their plan. Their plan was, please deliver Paul back to us because they had a group that wanted to ambush and kill him. They didn't have the evidence that he should die because he didn't do anything wrong. What they had was a plan, which by the way, again, outside of the law, breaking the law in so many ways, to have a group that would kill him on his way back to Jerusalem. So when Paul leaves with these men to go to, to, go to Caesar, trust me, no one's writing any letters about this. They had no evidence. This was all a trumped up charge. And as we would call today, it was a kangaroo court. And honestly, the Jews in Rome had heard nothing about this. Verse 22. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So let's talk about this. This group of Jews calls Christianity a sect. That is a wrong interpretation. Let me explain to you why. A sect is we have a group, and a group disagrees with the core of a group's tenets of their foundation, breaks away, and starts a parallel group with different rules. Does that make sense? 
Here's what you need to know about Christianity and Judaism. We do not disagree with any of the core issues of Judaism. Paul did not go, well, Moses was wrong, or David was wrong, or the prophets are wrong, or he doesn't say any of that. The difference is we see that Christ is the fulfillment, not a, not a, not a version. A sect is a version. And we see it as a fulfillment and so being called a sect would be wrong because for that to happen, that would mean that Paul and all the apostles were doing something, saying something was different about the core values of Judaism. They're not. They're actually saying we agree with the Psalms, we agree with, with, with the law, we agree with the prophets. We believe that they have spoken has been fulfilled. So they again see it as the next chapter, not a different version. So the word sect doesn't even apply. But it says, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. The people that are speaking against it are Jews. And there are two very serious reasons why it's spoken against. A lot of, minimum, a lot of other minor reasons, but there are two major reasons that it is spoken against. Number one, it is spoken against because Jesus did not fit their box. I've said this tons of and tons of times. They wanted the Messiah to come kick Rome's tail. He sits on the throne. They have power again. They have authority on this earth as a kingdom called Israel. And Jesus comes and says, I will die for you and I will set you free from your sins. And the Jews said, no thanks. And one of the things I want you to understand is, is that Jesus did not fit their box. And because he didn't fit their box, they didn't have any room for him. When your brain goes, this is what I want to see, and if I don't see it, therefore it doesn't matter, that's what happened. Until we get a Messiah that comes, rallies the people, fights Rome, destroys Rome, and there's a new king sitting in the temple in Jerusalem, then we haven't gotten what we wanted. And here comes Jesus saying things like, turn the other cheek, or if someone asks for your cloak, give him your shirt as well, or if someone says go one mile, you go two miles. And so what you have is that they had a box, and Jesus didn't fit the box. By the way, I completely get why they have a problem. Explain to you. Right now, as Christians, I will tell you there's going to be a second coming. In the second coming, we use verses as he will come with might and authority, and he will come and lay waste to the nations, and they will become, footstool, they will become like a footstool underneath his feet. That's the language we use. That language is the same language that the Jews read. Now listen, when you're under oppression, guess what you don't want to be? Oppressed. And if there are verses... They say, look, the Messiah is going to come and is going to take us away from this. What do you focus on? Those verses, because those verses give you hope. So what the Jews did is when they would read from the prophets, they would go, he's going to come with victory and might, and he's going to lay waste to the nations. That's what they wanted their Messiah to be. And then Jesus comes, quiet and meek, riding on a donkey. He didn't fit what they wanted. Now, I believe that's the reality of many Christians and non-Christians. They have a box that God fits in. And if he doesn't fit in that box, then they just pass him by. I want a God that lets me do whatever I want to do and doesn't make me feel bad for doing it. That's my God. I want a God that gives me what I ask for, no questions asked. I want a God that if I do everything right the way I'm supposed to, then nothing bad happens to my family. I want a God, and what happens is we put these things into these boxes, and then God comes and is his own version of God, and it doesn't fit our boxes, and people ignore him. Because for many of you, God is either too graceful or he's too judgmental. He's too kind or he's too wrathful. And the fact is, God is who he is. And it is our job to conform to him, not him to conform to us. And so, these Jews 
wanted a wrathful God that would come and fight for them and give them a kingdom on earth. And Jesus comes and says, my kingdom is not of this earth. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you and we'll come back and get you. And those Jews did not want it. The second reason why they had a problem was is that that this Jesus was letting the Gentiles in. They were letting the Gentiles in. They had been a people. They had been a line. They had been a bloodline. They had been a sacrifice system. They had been a washing, cleansing system. They had been a temple system. And Jesus comes along and fulfills all of that. And by fulfilling all that, takes away the need for all that. He is the greatest sacrifice. He is the greatest cleansing. He is the greatest temple. But to the Jews who have held on to that, that's very difficult for them. So look what it says. We want to know why you're spoken against. Well, it's spoken against because this Jesus doesn't fit your box, and you don't like that he's letting the world in. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers from morning till evening, he expounded to them. So they all come to his condo, and they're hanging out, and Paul stands out from morning till evening, and he is going to do nothing but use the scriptures that they know very well to prove that Jesus is who he says he is. Look what he says testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus both from the law from the, from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So from morning till night, he goes, this is what Moses said, and this is what Jesus fulfilled. This is what the prophets said, and this is what Jesus fulfilled. This is what David said, and this is what Jesus fulfilled. All day long, he uses their scriptures and goes, this is what it is, and this is who Jesus is. That's what he does all day long. But notice this. But he talks about the kingdom of of God, not the kingdom on this earth. The kingdom of God is not going to be defined by a place on the map. The kingdom of God is going to transcend these things, is going to transcend these issues, and that's what happens. And so in this process, you have Paul coming to them going, look, I want to give you Jesus. This is what Jesus does. This is what he fulfills. This is how he taught. This is what he said, and this is what this is about. Now watch what happens. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. Now, I have a question for you. Have you ever come into a situation with your mind already made up? Maybe. Maybe a little closed-minded. A little bit. And what's interesting is when you come with your mind, it's kind of like it really doesn't matter what's said. All you're hearing is blah, 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 blah. Because at the end, you're going to vote whatever you're going to vote or do whatever you're going to do. Does that make sense? And in that process, what's happening is that these people came and said, it doesn't matter what he says about this Jesus. Jesus is not on the throne, and we haven't defeated Rome. It doesn't matter what Paul says, because they're letting the Gentiles in. And so what happens is, is that those who opened up their hearts and opened up their minds and said, could this be a new message? They were the ones who were convinced. But the other ones are like, no, I know what my Messiah is supposed to look like. And I keep asking, is that true of us? No, this is what God's supposed to do in my life. This is what Jesus is supposed to do in my life. And until he does these things, he cannot be my God. And I'm just here to tell you, he is God. He is going to be the way he is. And he does not have to conform to your image of him. And you have got to understand that what you want out of him may not be what he wants out of you. And you've got to open your heart and say, maybe I need to look at this afresh and look at this new, because what Paul says next is very important. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul made one statement. This one statement is a quote from the book of Isaiah. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to, our, to your fathers. Now, what's interesting is when he started, he called them our fathers. When he makes this quote, he calls them your fathers. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers, through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For for this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. And I'm here to tell you 
that what this is talking about is, is that you have got to open your eyes and open your ears and not come to God with a preconceived, already plugged in version of who God is. Because the fact is, God is not confined. I will, I will, let me just give you an illustration of this. It's lame. I'm not telling you it's good. It is what it is. But there are those who say, if you do not sing the songs that I sang when I came to Christ in 1945, you don't know Jesus. Do you understand? Anyone who sings... and. I was at a church where literally we put drum, we were the, one of the first churches to put a drum set on the stage and people got up and left. I was at a church where we started using slides to project the songs up on the walls and little old ladies would hold up hymnals and shake them like we were offending the word of God. Folks, when we get closed down to only God works through hymnals, stained glass, and pews, which, by the way, every one of those things are beautiful. I'm being dead serious. If I choose, a, please understand, if I choose a church, most likely it's going to have pews, stained glass, and hymnals. Do you understand? Because that's what I grew up with. I like those things. I like the old rugged cross. I can sing every pick and line of it. But when we start to confine that God can only work in these ways, we miss a bigger picture. I told you, I used to tell people, if you wore jeans to church, you are not going to heaven. Because guess what? I didn't wear jeans to church, so therefore I wanted you to be like me, because therefore I was right. We've got to be careful, folks. Now, I'm just giving you a stupid illustration over clothing, but I'm telling you what's happening is when we close in and say, God only works this way, wow. Don't we tend to then become like the Jews? Goes, oh, oh, unless we have a Messiah that sits on the throne, then he's not the Messiah. But what is happening is you close your ears, close your eyes, and close your hearts when you come and say, God can only work the way I expect him to work. And then Paul drops the bomb. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles they will listen. He spends an entire day with them using their scriptures to show that Jesus is the Messiah, but at the end of the day, this is what he says. Therefore, I have given you all I can give you. I have shared Christ through the word, told you the truth. This is what it is. But my job is to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And he says, therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Here's the thing that's interesting about us Gentiles. We're not trapped, mainly, by all the heritage and all the trappings of bloodline and sacrifice and all these other things. What we're trapped with is that we have too many idols in our lives. Now, I'll be 45 this week. I know. I look pretty bad for 45, but I'm telling you. But here's what I'm learning at 45. I'm learning that most people play games where they're trying to get fulfilled through a lot of things, whether that could be through their job title, their house address, the emblem on their car, the emblem on their clothes, the, the letters after their name, and, and even the people that we marry, the people that we date, because we're trying to find this fulfillment in all these other things. And it's interesting that Paul comes and goes, let me tell you about the, not an idol, but let me tell you about the true God. And to the Gentiles, what we've got to do is stop playing around with all the other idols and start finding out that there is actually truth out there. That's the struggle for us talking to the Gentiles. We don't have to convince them of bloodline. We don't have to convince them of all this other stuff. We've got to convince them that what they're dabbling in is never going to fulfill them. That the next car is not going to do it. The next job is not going to do it. The next thing is not going to do it. Because here's the difference is that as you get older, you start to realize how empty all those things can be. And you really do start looking for the answer. And they will listen. Look what Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 16. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, uh, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus said that this was going to happen. Matthew 21, 43, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you 
and given to a people producing its fruits. Because the issue is whether or not our hearts are right and our, our, we have a heart of mercy, not whether we have a bloodline. Verse 30. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. So he had his little condo. Probably the Christians helped pay the rent. And he was waiting for Nero. Here's what's happening. When you get to Rome, he has requested to go to Caesar. But Caesar's going to get to him on his own time. It's not like, whoa, a Roman citizen showed up. I've got to talk with him tomorrow. So for two years, Paul just waits for Nero to call his number to come up and plead his case. So for two years, he welcomes anyone who will come and visit him. He's under house arrest, right? He has a little anklet brace on or whatever you want, a bracelet on or whatever. He can't leave. And so what's happening is, is that he makes this comment, and I want to say this to you. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And that ends the book of Acts. Listen to what he's saying. This is where God has me. Anybody who comes to this house, I am going to be telling them about Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. They're going to know that I love Jesus. I'm going to give them some tea, <laughs> and we're going to talk Jesus. I was listening to a pastor this week, and he moved into a new neighborhood. Oh, and I shouldn't say this because then people are going to hold me accountable. But he walked into a new neighborhood, and then he walked across the street to his neighbor, and they did the things, hey, how you doing? Yeah, we moved in. What do you do? The guy goes, I do blah, blah, blah. And he goes, so what do you do? He goes, I'm a pastor. And he turned to him, and he goes, okay, so when are we going to do this? And the neighbor goes, what? When are we going to talk about Jesus? Because it's going to happen. So either you can decide when it's going to happen, or I can decide when it's going to happen, but we're going to do this. I'm looking at my neighbors going, oh, man. <laughs> because what is he saying? If this is who what I'm about, right? Because if you go to anybody else's, they're going to tell you about their work. And he goes, sorry, this is who I am. Sorry, I moved in next door. And I've told you many times that when I moved into Colorado, the guy next to me almost didn't buy the house because he found out I was a pastor. And now I consider him a dear friend. Because he was just like, he was afraid that I was going to judge him or do whatever. And all I know is I came over to him and he goes, you're a pastor, huh? And that's how it started. And that's what we did. But I love Dennis and I, and, and I, and I continue to pray for him and work on him. Listen, folks, that's how the attitude of Paul. And this is what I want to say to you in this. Let me tell you why Paul has this attitude. Because Paul wrote this also. I want to run the race to win the prize. I want to finish the race. And I do not want to be disqualified. For those of you in this room that are in your 50s, 60s, and if you can hear me in your 80s, I want to say this to you very clearly. Do not take your foot off the gas. Do not. There's story after story after story of people who thought, oh, I got through and my kids are out. And honestly, they took their eyes off the prize and literally, literally lost their way in their later years. The inmates group about oh, five years ago went through a book that almost killed us. Um, it's a hard, heavy, deep book called Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. And uh, it was just tough. Dallas Willard will write in the beginning of his books, if you're not really serious about reading this book and you're not going to put effort into reading my books, put them down now. Because his stuff is just weighty and thick and heavy. Dallas Willard passed away last week. And I meet with Don Edwards every Monday morning, and him and I agreed that the world just became a little dumber when Dallas Willard passed away. Because he was an incredible mind. By the way, read, uh, read his books. Just go. He's a, but you got, I'm telling you, you've got to be ready. You've got to be ready to work through his books. He doesn't hand you any freebies. He just goes for it. But let me tell you about this. Dallas Willard, stage four cancer, finished well. If I meet anybody and they ask me what book should I read, one of the books I will tell you to have, them read, have you read is a book called Ragamuffin Gospel by a guy by the, by the name of Brennan Manning. 
amazing book. Brandon Manning just passed away this month. By the way, battled alcoholism to the end, but I want you to know he finished well. Paul is in this place, sitting in this house. By the way, he asks in the book, because this is where he writes First and Second Timothy. This is where he, where he writes uh, Titus. This is where he writes the book of Philemon. And in, and in Second Timothy is where he writes, pray for me that I will be bold in sharing my faith as I sit in these chains. In his older age, Paul, or later days, Paul is praying that he will be bold till the end. Look what he writes. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And then the book ends. And some people don't like that we don't get more information of what truly happened to Paul. This is the tradition of what happened to Paul. The tradition of what happened to Paul is at the end of the two years, Nero hears him, releases him, and Paul goes west, which is where he wanted to go towards into Spain. Very shortly after that is when Nero truly loses his mind, blames the Christians, and in grand sweeps arrests all the Christians. It is believed that Paul is arrested in one of these grand uh, sweeps and is executed. But he finished his work on the mission field. That's what the tradition says. But I do know this, that he finishes well. So, we finished the book, but I want to take you back to Acts chapter 1. And I told you from the very beginning, I believe this is the key to the entire book, is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let me read it to you. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And what we got to watch happen, Christ's ascension, the power of the Holy Spirit coming on the apostles, we got to see Pentecost, 3,000 come to Christ, and then after those weeks, more and more thousands start to come. Church begins to grow. The stoning of Stephen, by the way, with Saul and Indians, scatters the church into Judea and Samaria. Saul is converted to Paul. Paul takes the message through the known world, through Macedonia, through Asia, down into Greece, does all this, comes back and basically establishes the church, which, by the way, begins to expand and expand and expand. And today, in 2013, the church is still expanding its message around the world. Our job is to be a part of this rock dropped in Jerusalem, the rings going out, and we are a part of that. And we're going to go to Mexico and be a part of that. And we're going to help out with Save and be a part of that. And we're going to be a part of Compassion Network and be a part of that. And we're going to bring young people in through the Horner Outreach, and we're going to be a part of that. And we're going to help our missionaries in Russia and be a part of that. And we're going to send small-term, short-term missionaries around the world, and we're going to be a part of that. And you need to be a part of that on your street, in your office, at your school, and at your play. You need to be a part of that. Because what we have watched is this. Follow me. Church scattered. Paul going throughout the known world from that. The struggle of these people coming together, Jews, Gentiles, the process of those people trying to find common ground. And in the middle of it is Jesus. And at the middle of it is Paul telling his story. And listen to me. I'm telling you the key to everything we have done is found in verse 8. It is right here. And you will be my witnesses and that is what you and I today at Inroads Church are supposed to be is witnesses to tell our story to say this is who I was before Jesus and then Jesus came to my life and this is who I am after Jesus let's talk maybe you need to walk into your office and go okay we're going to do this so this is going to be on your time or my time but we're going to do this Folks, please understand that the book of Acts has been here to challenge us, challenge us to take our witness and keep it scattering throughout the world on our streets, in our workplaces, at our schools, in our very homes. And I'm just encouraging you to look back over what we've studied 
and be motivated, encouraged, and blessed. Blessed that God has called you faithful for those who are faithful and has given you the right to bear his name even in suffering. And with that, I pray for you. Jesus, would you be with us as we process your word? Would you be with us as we take in that which you have given us? Father, through all of these months, through all of these days of just pouring through your word, would you make it alive in us? And may we be witnesses to all that are around us of your love and your grace and your mercy. I love you and I thank you that you've given us the opportunity, the opportunity to freely hear your word. And I just so thank you that you came for us Gentiles. And you opened the door for us to be called your sons and daughters. And as you adopt us into your family and give us full rights as heirs, may we live in honor of our Father and to the glory of his name, through the blood of his son Jesus. Amen. All right.